Greetings from Paris, and welcome to our panel on advancing women in STEM all around the world. I have today with me four speakers who are scientists, policy makers, and advocates who are representing diverse populations from all around the world. They will be providing us a report, an update, on the narrative and status of women in STEM from their region, which ranges from Guatemala, the United States, France, Argentina, and South Africa. As for myself, my name is Juliana Chan. I am the founder and chief executive officer of Wild Type Media Group, and I'm also a science journalist. I'm very delighted to be a moderator for today. So I will be introducing our four speakers one by one, starting with, of course, Professor Karen Holberg. She is a For Women in Science Laureate 2019 for Latin America. Hello, Professor Holberg. Welcome. She's a professor in physics at the Balsero Institute in Argentina and also the principal researcher at the Bariloche Atomic Center. Professor Holberg, would you please share with us your journey and your work in using computing approaches to understand the physics of quantum matter, and perhaps a little bit on your work on ethics and uh, social responsibility of scientists. Karen, please. Thank you very much, uh, Juliana. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here in this very important uh, subject, uh, promoting women in STEM. Um, as you said, I'm from Argentina. I live in the south of Argentina, in Patagonia. There's a research institution, and uh, we do research there with my students. I also teach. Uh, but apart from my professional uh, career in physics, as you mentioned, we're doing uh, state-of-the-art numerical uh, calculations and numerical codes to study uh, the quantum behavior of matter uh, using quantum information uh, technology. I'm very interested in promoting uh, women in science, uh, also promoting other less advantaged uh, groups of society in science. Thank you, Professor Holbrook. Next, we have Professor Francoise Combe. She's a for women in science Laureate 2021, a most this year recent laureate. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. And you are an astrophysicist at the Paris Observatory and a professor at the College de France, where you have been the chair of galaxies and cosmology since 2014. Professor Combe, would you please share with us more about your work on galaxy formation and evolution, please? Yes, I am um, doing research at Paris Observatory and observing galaxies and looking back in time to go to the Big Bang to know uh, how the galaxies are forming at the beginning and uh, forming uh, uh, the stars, in fact, that uh, consist uh, all the disk of galaxies. And, of course, uh, the stars are formed from the gas so that we observed a lot of molecules, organic molecules in the interstellar space. They are forming a lot of stars and that's why we are here with the sun and the, and the earth. <laughs> and about women in STEM, I am also promoting them. Uh, I have been in my uh, career about 37 PhD students, and half of them are women. So It's actually very great to hear that there's so many women in astrophysics, so thanks for the update. Moving on, we have Africa Flores, Severe Land Cover and Land Use Change Lead at the NASA Applied Science. So, Africa, could you please share with us your journey that led you to move from Guatemala all the way to the University of Alabama in the United States. I grew up in Guatemala, and uh, I remember the stories of my parents and grandparents enjoying natural resources, clean water, playing in the rivers, fishing there, some luxuries that I didn't have in my hometown when I was growing up. That really drive my interest to study something that helped me to manage our natural resources, because in this very small piece of land, there is so much richness, but it's so badly managed. So that led me to study agronomy and uh, the field of STEM. Over there, I discovered geographic information systems, and I started working with satellite data. And that's how I made the jump to the program SERVIR, in which our main goal is to build the capacity of countries around the world to use satellite data and air observations for environmental monitoring. I had the opportunity to go back to Guatemala and use uh, AI and uh, satellite data to forecast harmful algal blooms in one of the most beautiful lakes in the world, Lake Atitlan. No bias because I am from Guatemala, uh, but it is the most beautiful lake in the world. Okay, 
Last but not least, we have Ms. Doni Kunu. Doni is a bilateral engagement lead for climate change at the Adaptation Research Alliance at South South North. So, and you're also pursuing your PhD at the Global Change Institute at Witwatersrand University in South Africa. But Doni, what I'm most interested in is the project that you started, Black Women in Science, a non-profit that you set up to support young black women scientists. Mm -hmm. Would you please share a little bit about your, you know, your main job mm -hmm. and then, of course, black women in science, yeah, sure. please. So my main job is really looking at climate change and climate research and trying to see how we can move from the research into the actual action of, of these projects, be it water solutions, be it energy solutions, be it infrastructural solutions, but we really focus on how do we move into the action. And then, um, well, within that journey, I obviously started an organization called Black Women in Science, mm. and this is because I saw that the higher I went in the academic ladder, the fewer people I saw that looked like me. And then I realized that there's actually a term for it called the leaking pipeline, meaning that we have women coming in as undergraduates or in high school going into undergraduate graduate level, first year of university or tertiary, and then you see them like disappearing somewhere when it comes to their postgraduate studies. And so I was more interested into why is that happening and how do we make them stay in the system and how do we retain them in that system? Well, the leaky pipeline that you describe in South Africa is certainly also present in Asia, mm. where I'm from. So I guess we have a lot to talk about. Yes. <laughs> Without further ado, I'm just going to go on to, to, to a very important question. I would like to find out from our four speakers, what is the situation like for scientists in your country, or perhaps more broadly, your region? And in the past 10 years, have you seen any changes or improvements for women in your field of research, either through more tradi traditional career paths or non-traditional career paths? I know that's a very big question, but what, what I really am asking is, what have you seen in the last 10 years, and do you have anything good to report back to base today? Maybe we'll start with Karen. Um, well, um, I would uh, like to be much more optimistic uh, at, at this stage of evaluating the situation. I'm optimistic in the long run, uh, but you know, a couple of years ago, UNESCO uh, announced that uh, less than 30% of the researchers worldwide uh, in science were women. This uh, number includes social sciences and humanistic uh, sciences, so I would venture to say that women work in uh, research in, in STEM uh, are much less than that. I, I don't know the number because that hasn't been evaluated properly. But uh, imagine I would just maybe, we are, I think, less than 20% of researchers worldwide. I'm just uh, guessing, but that must be the number. In Latin America, in Argentina, the situation is uh, slightly better. Uh, for example, in Argentina, in physics, there are 30% uh, students, women students who are studying physics, but then that number decreases very rapidly uh, while the women continue in their careers. So this is a little bit worrying. This still has to change, it has to evolve. I'm op optimistic because the numbers are uh, 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 increasing very gradually. Uh, so now we have maybe 30% plus of women. We have a positive slope, although the slope is, is, mm. quite, uh, is quite flat still. There's a lot to do. Uh, but, uh, and if we look at uh, women working in, for example, quantum computing and quantum technologies and quantum science, which is my field, uh, then it's much, much less than that I say, uh, in the conference as I participate, there are less than 5% women. So there's a lot to do, and I think it's great that we talk about this, because I hope we can inspire other women to continue. Well, thank you for, for telling us, and we will be talking about some ideas on how we can change that. Moving on, um, Africa, why don't you share with us what has it been like? I guess you can speak for both uh, Guatemala and also the UN United States because you've seen mm -hmm. both countries. Yes, exactly. I think that there has been significant advances, but there still remain main challenges to be addressed. There are more women studying STEM fields. I am in the field of Earth System Sciences, and you can see a lot of entry jobs as well, but one of the main issues is the leaking pipeline, maintaining and retaining women in these fields and uh, for them to occupy higher level positions. Uh, on the good side, I think that I have seen in these 10 years, which the field has advanced tremendously, I have to say, because we 
have never had as much data and information as we have today from satellites to monitor our world, and things are moving super fast. But also a very good change is that there had more and more networks of women uh, that I didn't know that existed. And they're just creating as we speak. We have ladies on Lanza, Sister of SARS, and uh, a lot of many other, like Geo Latinas, and that very strong networks that allow us to stick together and share experiences, learn from each other, and uh, know that we are not alone, which is something uh, very important because many times, particularly in this field, uh, you may feel that you do not belong. Uh, it's a boys club out there. Uh, but with these networks, you realize that there are other women that are going through the same uh, issues. And uh, we also support each other uh, at the academic level to promote our research as well. Thanks, Africa. And moving on to Francoise, please tell us how it is like in Paris or France, more broadly, or maybe you can even speak for the European uh, European region. Well, in France at least, uh, and uh, European, it's a little different from the south and the north, you know. Mm. There is the Latin uh, countries, Spain, Italy, France, which have a lot of women, well, at least uh, in STEM, it's 30%, 35%. And uh, the north, Anglo-Saxon, uh, Germany, for instance, there is much less. Mm. So there is some cultural uh, facts about that. And uh, for France in the past, it was 30 35%, and uh, uh, we see that in the senior level now, but um, uh, there is a worrying uh, tendency in the last 10 years that uh, to get a permanent position after having a PhD, mm. then you have to wait more than before. Before it was one or two years, you had a postdoc for two years, and then you get a permanent position. So it was really favorable for women. And then now you, you obtain a permanent position at six, seven years after your PhD. And this it means that you must be mobile to go to one place to the other and other countries. And this for women is very difficult because they want to settle down, to find a family and so on. And of course, men are more favorable. They can wait for a longer time. And in general, they don't abandon. So it's uh, more competitive now for women, I think. And we see that already in the young people. It's less than 30%. And I think we have to react to that. But uh, a more positive point is for the senior one. I think that uh, before there was a strong uh, glass uh, ceiling that there was no people, no women in uh, director of uh, institute or president of university and so on. It is now people are aware of that and are selecting more women at the high level. So, uh, for instance, I can give an example. When I entered, there was no, no women at all in astrophysics, for instance. And now in the STEM, there is about 10% elected in academy. So it's a great progress <laughs> in the last 10 years. There is also in college, where there is a lot of selection also. But there is uh, humanities and STEM, so it's 20%, much better. Uh, university president is 15% now. It's a uh, real progress. And the uh, director of institute for CNRS is uh, even 25%. So I think in the senior part, there is a positive tendency, And in the junior part, uh, unfortunately, and that we have to react that and to, to solve this problem. <laughs> I, I, t I have noticed too that the, the length of time between your PhD and you know, a faculty position has actually lengthened in Asia as well, but six to seven years seems like quite a long stretch. Mm. The point you brought up about positions becoming less permanent and more contract-based is also a worrying problem that I see in many parts of the world. Doni, how about South Africa. Mm. Um, so I think it's very similar to the trend um, that we have internationally, um, but obviously we're having a slower trend of, of growth in South Africa, and it, it goes back to access, it goes back to finances in, in, in my country, in the sense that it's, it is a privilege to do a postgraduate studies, it is a privilege to go to university. Education is not free and very expensive. And so I think um, that on its own creates the, creates the inequality. And um, as Africa said, 
we tend to focus now as, okay, let's get our students from their high school, their primary school, um, into universities to study science, and then we leave them, and, and then they're left alone, and then they, it, goes, it's good, it gets lonelier and lonelier, and the ones that are staying in the system are now getting discouraged. And so um, one thing that I've realized is that the networking is very, very important. As an organization, if we provide our, our fellows um, with business training or communication training or writing training, they don't actually care about that. What they actually want is to be able to sit with someone and say, I'm really struggling to do this. How did you make it? And how do I get out of this? You know? And so that's what they appreciate more, is sitting together and communicating together. And most importantly, Recently, I think that the positive side of this is that they are now wanting to become mentors. They are now wanting to change the status quo. They are now wanting to have impact on the ground. And you don't have to kind of find them. They're kind of saying, I'm here. Is anyone listening to what I'm saying? You know? And I think that is so great because now you have a woman who want to stretch themselves outside of the science block that says, sit in your lab and, and get out results and publish papers. And they're saying, wait a minute, I can't publish unless I feel that I belong here and I feel like I'm worthy to be here. So I would definitely say it's mentorship, it's, it's wanting to be visible, it's also the networks that are coming in, that people are now wanting to become in networks and talk about their issues, and most importantly, it's about how they are realizing that they can actually have an influence to younger women. So because you're, you're currently in your graduate studies, do you feel well supported right now mm. as a woman in science in your university? Uh, I don't want to attack my university. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to my university. Um, you know, I feel like they're doing their best. Mm. But I think in, in, as working with the women that I work with right now, in my organization I've worked with like over 250 black women, mm. and we're having a challenge of the science discipline itself in the sense of it actually being designed for what the modern scientist wants. So the modern scientist wants to understand where do I fit in the world, can I start a business? Do I, fi do I fit into a, a bigger picture? Can I communicate my research? When I communicate my research, does anyone care? Is anyone willing to invest? And we, we, they're not adjusting to these needs. And so then they, people are saying, oh, I just want to get into entrepreneurship and business. I don't think I want to get into science. I want to get into communication. And it's not that science is a bad industry. I think what they need to do as institutions is incorporate skills like communications, like yes. writing, like, yes. you know, engaging, like, you know, just changing the game a bit to, to fit into the changes around us and no longer just focusing on you have to publish to stay in sciences. Many of these organizations are very good at supporting us in traditional academic mm. career paths, right? But then, are we able to support young scientists mm. on non-traditional career mm. paths? And, and you really mentioned something about what young scientists aspire to do, which mm. is to spin off companies, start up, mm. be founders mm. and innovators, mm. inventors, you mm. know? So, um, I, I, does the black women in science do that? Mm. Do you yes, definitely. That yeah, so our training specifically focuses on scientists that want to understand business, where do they link up in business, where do they link up in communications, and, and that is for me very important. So we focus on, if you have an idea, can you make it financial? If not, that's fine. But the fact that you want to think about something else, do it and really understand that. And the importance of this is that when, when you stand in front of people, you are able to communicate what you're doing because you're no longer just speaking to the general scientific audience, but you're communicating to a, you know, a broader audience. Yeah, I mean, the commercialization of science is one aspect that I wish more scientists were, were taught in graduate school. I certainly wasn't, mm. and I think it would be very helpful if we were, we were given a crash course in that. Well, we definitely have a lot to wish for in terms of what we would need, and, and you've touched a lot of these topics, Doni. Maybe we'll start with Karen on this. What do you wish or hope for that your governments and your academic institutions can do to encourage at the start of the pipeline, girls to enter scientific careers, and when they are already in scientific careers, how do we retain them and push them and help them along? Because we are seeing a very dramatic change in the way researchers do their research during the pandemic. Well, um, thank you for that question, because I think it's one of the most important ones. What, what, what can we do to change the situation? Uh, I, I think uh, we need a deep cultural change, and uh, so the society and government and, and uh, private entrepreneurs, uh, that we're all 
uh, we should all be uh, pushing towards this uh, important cultural change. Science has, uh, from, from the government, let's say, because since it was your question, uh, science has to be uh, much more uh, open, uh, more, um, uh, to p it has to permit more in the society, it has to be more present. Uh, we need a lot more uh, scientific culture. From the beginning, since they are in, uh, in, in the kindergarten, uh, they, the children should learn to think more. I mean, think what is called the, the critical thinking or scientific thinking. I don't like to call it scientific thinking because it's not only related to science. It's think, to learn to think has to do uh, it's it's uh, a skill you learn for the rest of your life, and it's very important that uh, the the young girls and boys, like they learn to ride a bike, they also learn to think, the abstract thinking, logical thinking, to be careful with magnitudes, with uh, with um, uh, even with lateral thinking, to be creative. So I mean, during their careers, I think it's very important. To uh, to have to consider, for example, a child care centers at the at the research institutions, because I have two children, and uh, and I had them at the beginning and at the end of my of my PhD, and I was able to continue with my career. I only stopped for three or four months with each child, because I had a, a, a child care center in on campus. This was fundamental for me. I could breastfeed them because it was very important for me to breastfeed them until they were a year old, while I could continue with my career without, uh, you know, stopping uh, or interrupting a scientific career is sort of a major <laughs> uh, disruption. So this, uh, this should be avoided. And, and of course, uh, I mean, that comes from the family, sharing with the partner, household and everything. The evaluation has to be flexible with women who are pursuing scientific careers. Uh, of course, uh, it, it, it shouldn't go in detriment of the scientific excellence or scientific response, but yes, it should be flexible. It should consider childcare leave or even maybe adult care. I mean, if we have uh, elderly uh, living at home with us. So I think this should be incorporated in the evaluation, again, without detriment of the scientific career. Uh, so so this, this is the one of the things that COVID left us. The other thing I think is very positive is the possibility of having uh, hybrid uh, uh, conversations or hybrid or even uh, um, long distance conferences. If, not only for women who, are, who have to take care of uh, women or men, they have to take care of the uh, household uh, duties, but also for us living in remote countries. It was very important for us, the, the possibility of being able to participate in conferences or in, in talks, uh, uh, seminars of people all around the world. I cannot agree more because we always think that you need some dramatic policy change mm -hmm. and sometimes you just need mm. a childcare facility on, 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 on campus, isn't it? Yes. But there are of course many things we can change from small to, to big and uh, more flexible uh, policy uh, performance evaluations would be very, very good start. Okay, thank you. And moving on, Africa. I'm very interested in your story because, in particular, uh, you shared with me that you have had a you had a child during the pandemic, and that is a very unique experience, I must say, because you probably are balancing working from home and you probably couldn't get as much help as you could because of social distancing. So, could you share with us? Um, from the perspective of having had a child, what would you like to see different, maybe, maybe in your case and also for everyone else? Yes, I can attest how difficult the pandemic was uh, for a young scientist or the middle career scientist that uh, is in, at the stage of having kids. I have my, my second child during the pandemic. And uh, childcare was closed, so we have our daughter, three years old, and a new baby, and we have to work. Um, one of the maybe main things, I know that we are in the 21st century, but in the U.S. particularly, it's necessary to have mandatory paid maternity and paternity leave. Mm. So to normalize that women can work. We don't have to feel that we have to choose between family and our career. And that's the position in which we are right now. And that's why in the tech industry and science, uh, it's very difficult. It's extremely difficult. Uh, you, have, you feel that you have to choose. Um, and by implementing these policies that maybe they are 
normal in other parts of the world, <laughs> uh, I think that is long, long, long needed for the U.S. to implement this. Uh, another thing is affordable and effective childcare, uh, which also doesn't exist uh, in that form in the, in the U.S. Um, because it makes it very difficult for women scientists to be a scientist. You know, you always feel like you have to be choosing uh, between both careers. I actually understand what you're, you're, you're speaking about because I spent many years in the U.S. as well and I saw some of my, my colleagues who had kids and it was very challenging for them. So what did you do if you weren't offered uh, paid leave. Mm. Do you just take unpaid leave or sick leave? It's unpaid leave. So unpaid because leave. I have been working for such a long time, I was able to accumulate enough uh, leave. Like annual leave? Uh -huh, my annual leave, all my vacation, all the uh, thing, And uh, it's only 12 weeks, actually. We, we have FMLA, mm -hmm. so it only allows for 12 maximum. That's the maximum that you can take which is unpaid. Uh, so I think that that creates unequal conditions. And one thing, and an additional thing I would like to, to mention is that gender equality in STEM is not about asking for privileges to women only and, you know, special conditions for right. us. For me, gender equality in STEM is a matter of human rights. Exactly. Because as a mother, you know, I have a completely supported, uh, supportive husband, uh, but what if he will not be with us. And we actually, you know, we were completely vaccinated when we got COVID and nothing bad. Uh, but you have to be prepared to take care of your family. You're a working woman. Mm -hmm. And I should be allowed mm -hmm. to take care of my own family mm -hmm. if I am working, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's why it is a matter of human rights. We are just asking for uh, a just system just for Justin, it's just a matter of that. And uh, implementing these uh, small changes that they are not that small because they have real implications of how we uh, stay in the field are critical. I feel you, I feel you. I had two babies when I was uh, on an assistant professor in tenure track. And I had actually four months of uh, maternity leave. And even then, I found it very difficult already. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine if you had to take, mm -hmm. you know, all of your, accumulate all your annual leave. And even then, it wasn't, you know, maternity leave that was, was, mm -hmm. was your right to, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And moving on, uh, Francoise, how can we make our workplaces more, you know, inclusive of women talents? Uh, I think this is all aspirational, but I think some of that you can already implement. As yes, I agree with, very much with all Karen has said. And I think, well, for the, uh, the job uh, given to women, I think that uh, we, we were discussing uh, a moment ago about the postdoc and the long <laughs> time to wait. I think that we could, uh, at least the government could um, follow what uh, is done in the US, for instance, where you have a tenure track, where you can be, well, it's not completely permanent, but at least it promised that after a few years you will have a permanent job, if it, you succeed, of course, at primary school. You have a cultural problem mm -hmm. and stereotypes. When they are young, even before 10, that uh, um, girls have these uh, ideas in the mind that there are some jobs that are not done for, for girls, and we have to change that because it's not true. When you look at uh, uh, girls in, um, in studies, in universities, they, have, they are more successful the, the exam, the end of studies are more successful. There are 55 percent to succeed and 45 of men. So they have more success in maths, in physics and so on. But it's just after that they are going to another path, not engineer, because it's not a girl job. Mm -hmm. And as for the COVID, I think uh, indeed uh, uh, young women at least not uh, uh, senior one, because it was even better for senior ones, <laughs> but for young women who had children, in fact, it was very, very difficult. And uh, the um, solution we had is to give them more time to finish their PhD, for instance. So mm. we gave one year more, mm. and it was accepted. <laughs> it's very good. So, very good. Uh, <laughs> so at yeah. least, mm. and it is also taken into account mm. when you, you take a job, to people and there are competition with men. You have one year more for each child who have uh, grown up. Mm -hmm. So this is taken into account. So mm. at the, even for awards or for any elections, uh, we take that into account. So at least so we are aware of the difficulties and um, 
we, we take a solution for that. Mm. So for the COVID, I, I agree also that the Zoom uh, <laughs> <laughs> meetings were very, very yes. useful. I remember many times I couldn't attend conferences because I had an infant. I had two children while I was, on, I was in my tenure track. So that was a challenge for me. You know, Francois, you talked about stereotypes in, 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 in primary school, in, in, in books, in textbooks. I think the media has also a lot of oh, yes. role to play because now I'm a science journalist and publisher. I can tell you if you take a look at any of the, the TV shows and movies, or just like a stock photo library, it's always you know, a male scientist and two assistants mm -hmm. who are mm -hmm. always female. Yeah. I, think, I think we have a, a huge part to play in this uh, changing this uh, narrative mm -hmm. it will of take who time. is a scientist. You know? mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing. Doni, how is, um, what would you say you would like to see change in South Africa? Mm. But um, I think, you know, in as much as, you know, it was great to have Zoom meetings and have access to Zoom meetings, but majority of South Africans and Africans don't have access to data. Ah. And, and that is, that's another conversation that it becomes even more of the privilege of the privilege to get data. And so once lockdown happened, um, our universities completely flipped and now lecturers had to go online, but the students don't have data. How do they provide access to data so the students can learn online? Never mind data, laptops, you know. There is, there is, there is a huge, you know, different level of um, accessibility. So when I read one of the articles um, along during COVID, it was around publishing and how it shows that women um, are publishing less in open-ended journals. So I, I support open-ended journals because I want people to have access. And so for me, it would be how do we um, encourage women or incentivize women to, or universities, how do universities incentivize that women publish more, that um, women from developing countries publish more, and incentivize them by giving them data, by giving them time, by giving them a laptop, you know, and, and all of that is very, very important because um, maybe little things that you, you, we might look at as a normal a normal access, someone else doesn't have. Mm -hmm. And so even um, if someone is in as a woman scientist and they are told to go to a Zoom meeting as an, as an African scientist, they, they might think this is too much work. I have to manage that my student doesn't have data right now and they need to write the exam. And how will they write the exam? How do I monitor that? So I can't attend the Zoom invite that I'm being invited to. So how do you incentivize them and make sure that in, within these conferences that are online, we have representation within those conferences. It was much easier if you are walking down the corridor in university right. and you bump into a conference or something that's happening in a, in a lecture room and you decide, oh wow, well, let me join, is it free? And you go in and you join. Now there are costs involved, there, there's data involved, there's laptops, there's technology, there's quality of, you know, it's, it's a lot. And, and it all comes down to access and affordability. And so for me, it's about how do we make, how do we even ensure diversity within those Zooms? So if we are looking at how many participants were there, how many of them were for Afri from African countries or developing countries, or how many of them um, you know, were African, how many of them were Latin American, you know, how do we ensure diversity and not think we're doing such a big impact but we're actually just talking still, the higher elites are still just talking to each other, but it's now that they can just meet between China and America and, you know. So for me, it's always about, it's about access and, and are we really being sure about that within that access during COVID, are we still being fair to women and to African women and to, you know, upcoming scientists and emerging scientists? Very, very powerful words. Thank you very much, Joni. All right, I would like to thank our four speakers for their generous insights today. Clearly, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. But fortunately, we have four of you leading your community and your country. So I thank the audience for your participation. And perhaps you could join me in giving our speakers a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.